Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Costa Desk for the 2021 World Finals. I'm Atlas. I'm proud to be joined by Kobe and Vettius. Gentlemen, it all comes down to this. Finally, two first seeds in the final. And that shining Summoner's Cup in the middle of it all. Atlas drawing everyone's attention. Let's jump right in to the picks and bands. Yumi and Twisted Fate from red side. No surprise here. Expect these to remain, but Lee Sin is a big question. I feel like every team that was given Canyon, Lee Sin has regretted it. And what is their final band going to be? Are they going to cover jungle? And already, how interesting is this? The Lissandra band comes out from Darwin to say, hey, you want to ban Lee? We'll take LeBlanc. Oh, you yeah. want to remove LeBlanc? We'll there take Lee. This and is a trap card. They set up the trap. They, they certainly They have did. a free ban. They may as well throw it out there. The Lee Sin, as you said, going to be banned away. Obviously, LeBlanc the follow-up, but now what do we do on the other side? Jin's been such high priority, Jarvan's still available as well. I love the Jin point because it throws to astronomical levels of priority in the T1 DK series. And Ghost showing that he does have other options though, because now Jin taken away, he has gone to the Ziggs, which also gives you long range, safe wave clear, or even the Draven, which I expect a much less chance of because Jin's already decent pick into Draven. So this puts more priority, more crunch time on that. Uh, Ziggs possibility, and that kind of loads you up with AP. So the bottom lane, there it is. They don't hesitate yeah. with that AP. All right, question answered immediately. Thank you very much. I really like it, but the whole top lane champion pool is wide open. Both of these top laners love their Jace, love their Graves, and if you've got a Ziggs in the bottom lane, you need tons of AD damage. The lethality becomes all that more valuable. And so now, that Graves or Jace looking real juicy for Dom. They certainly do. And Khan, Khan Jace would be uh, would be so big for him in, in his last professional series. Oh yeah. Iconic champion for him, but they're gonna go with support down on bottom side, grab that Rakan up very quickly. This has been a super high priority champion as far as the engaged supports go. Yes, there have been more and more enchanters creeping in, but Rakan uh, puts a lot of threat on those, and you can combine with Ziggs for some very surprising kill opportunities as well. Well, I am a little surprised to see the rise. Of course, if you've looked at Scout's match history, you probably wouldn't <laughs> yeah. be. It's top of the list. It is top of the list But he's for played him. 11 unique champions, Betty. Right, but his most played is definitely the rise. So it's a big comfort pick for him. And when you kind of look at the mid-jungle duel, yes, it can certainly be strong, but picking it into LeBlanc, Showmaker loves this matchup. It was one that he was more than happy to play into Faker himself and was able to get the better of him in, especially when paired up with the Kiana. And this is something I'd love to see EDG ban away. I like the Talon ban, but they also need to take Cannon off that Kiana because of how well it enables the LeBlanc. But then, of course, Xin Zhao still up and available. So you know that Cannon's options are still very, very wide. Yeah. Big thing for Dom1 is that they have been so flexible, especially Canyon and Showmaker in the champion pools. So they have a lot of confidence in being able to, to get through the second round of advance here. But I I just love that we're still seeing similar trends continue for both of these teams. And EDG have focused very heavily on team fighting and still went uh, you know, with that setup for Jarvan. You mentioned the, the rise and the possibilities for affecting those side lanes. I want to see the question of Flandre. They already ban out the Kenning here from topside uh, by DK. But if they also leave the Graves up, that feels like a no-brainer with it being picked over and over and over for them. I really like yeah. the Leona removal as well here from Damwon. It is something that Mako did bring out, even though throughout this tournament he has been playing a lot of ranged supports. Showcasing the Leona was a big answer last week in their semifinals that helped them pull through. But with the cannon gone, with the Gwen still open, it could be an option for Damwon. But when you already have an AP bot side of the map, perhaps EDG is sitting there saying, well, we expect you to do an AD top jungle right now, and that means the Grave should be a pretty solid blind. Yeah, and so far this draft looks like the meta combined with EDG. It's pretty quintessential right now. But if you look over the other side, Darmon are doing a similar thing to what we saw T1 try to do against EDG in their first matchup, which is probably going to be the Jace Ziggs sort of pseudo poke composition for late game threat around objectives and things like this as oh! that's a Yasuo so never mind yes never mind and that's Khan playing Yasuo as well yes we were looking for the spicy picks uh, it you know, happens in game one <laughs> exactly we get it in game number one here definitely will create a volatile top side of the map and that's one of the two things pulling these two teams in different directions in a lot of cases where EDG is so much focused on Viper on the bottom side and yet 
Dom one expected to put a lot of pressure on the top triangle of the map. That mid jungle top lane picks. Now they've got Zin LeBlanc and Yasuo at top side. That is as spicy as you get. Those are very volatile lanes with lots of kill pressure. And now Mako is looking at one of these engaged supports. You guys have already mentioned that we haven't seen him so much oh, is on these. He? Okay, never mind. We're putting a clock in the bottom lane instead. All right, the spice wasn't reserved just for Dom One. It is, of course, also for EDG as the Zillion is and locked in last. Zillion is so good versus teams that have large amounts of burst damage. And and Dom One definitely do have uh, have that in spades. They've invested in it. It's gonna come down to some very quick timings and quick fingers. Zillion can be a big flop if you don't get it off uh, before the Recon engage. It's all about bursting people down before you get that cooldown out or having good positioning and utilizing the speed to keep your spacing between your carry. Oh, I'm just so excited about this matchup. First game already, we've got very unique drafts. And gentlemen, this is Khan's first ever professional Yasuo game. Yeah. And it's in the World Finals, potentially his final oh, series. Man. What a time to pull it out. Perhaps fishing for a, a <laughs> world skin, maybe? We were having a chat about this, weren't we, Kobe? We were wondering whether there was going to be a sneaky Riven game thrown in or something. But instead, he's gone with the Yasuo. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what he's been cooking up in solo queue and behind the scenes for us. Because when Khan debuted, he was all aggression. He was basically a Riven one-trick when he made his debut, which was many years ago now. To come back to his roots here in game one of the final is, uh, yep, that takes some stones. And I love how both teams are making adjustments here. Uh, on the other side, EDG taking one of the tools that T1 used against Dom1 successfully early on to counter some of the, the first options that they had in the Zillion. Now it's about executing, though, and actually piloting that well. They've also invested in stealing away the Jin from Ghost. And we have seen some very big pick opportunities off of this champion. So we'll see if they can make it happen. So exciting getting into the World Finals here. Yeah, here we are under the rift for game number one of the 2021 World Championship. Already, I think the teams have delivered these drafts feeling very EDG, feeling very dumb one Kia, especially the top lane, feeling very calm at the moment. So the first thing I would like to draw our attention to as we wave the camera, is Beryl is running Predator on Rakan. <laughs> <laughs> he is all about the Ronins. It seems like that each Darmon member is taking it in turns as to who will run Predator. Perhaps we'll see a Khan Predator top lane later on in the series. But what is crucial here, and what is something that we need to focus on, is when we saw Showmaker drafting this LeBlanc into the rise in the semifinals, it was constantly attacking that mid lane, looking to shut Scout down. And when you have the Rakan, Xin Zhao, LeBlanc combo, I expect Darmon to be looking to do the same thing again. And this is them learning off of their series versus T1. One of the ways that you want to try and punish the Zillion pick is either try and go super hard at the Zillion in lane, very weak early laning phase, and it's much more for scaling, or you just roam heavy. And the Predator is really signaling that yes, he definitely wants to go <laughs> roam heavy here. Barrel, I feel like, has really been an underappreciated part of this Dom Juan lineup since the MSI underperformances from him, but especially this year at Worlds. He has been a integral part of the entire amount of success that they've had here in this big run. Yeah, and of course, Beryl took that underperformance at MSI and brought it to the summer season as well. It was not a great time for Beryl all the way up until the World Championship. But ladies and gentlemen, we want to hear from you. Use that hashtag Verizon 5G all chat and let us know how you feel about the World Final. Are these compositions exactly what you wanted to see? Is some Biffo on the bottom side here, Viper throwing out some bullets. Not quite the fourth one just yet, but EDG with control of the wave. Now we can see that both junglers are doing opposite paths to one another, with the Xin Zhao starting on the bot side, passing towards top, looking to potentially cover Khan uh, in the event of any early ganks, or perhaps to look for a potential gank themselves. Or meanwhile, JJ starting up on the top side and passing towards bot, where he expects to have prio. With the Jin and the Zillion, you should have push in the early 2 versus 2 especially against the Ziggs, who doesn't have the strongest wave per early on, so he should be able to secure himself that first Scuttle Crab off the game. Yeah, and exactly, and the reason that EDG went for the deep ward on blue buff and Gromp that you can see right now for Flandre is because you want to get the most out of the early pushing there with Graves. You know you're going to shove lane early. So they've got the early vision here on the blue up that will expire, knowing that Canyon started bottom side and should be able um, to play accordingly. Flandre, he's already been able to bounce his wave off of the tower. Uh, and and should be playing around, as Vedia said, the opposite side starts for these junglers. 
Yeah, and it looked like that ward didn't quite spot Canyon, but did give them enough information, right? They knew that he hadn't headed towards that blue buff area just yet. Yeah, it's the process of elimination. Yeah, uh, right. jungle camps early. He on, cannot be anywhere else. They're very easy uh, to actually track and coordinate with just one single deep ward. So it will be traded scuttle crabs. And as you can see, after bouncing the wave, Flandre playing it much more safe, even stayed up here. Let's Khan push back. Thank you, Observer, so much. He's, uh, you know, playing around jungle presence. Very big for mid laners to also do this. It's it's a much less obvious way where they just kind of hover up to the side where their jungler is, but is uh, equally as important. And Showmaker should be able to catch this one. And as we get close to those first backs, because you can already start to see them come out from a few members, it will be this level four from Beryl, where you need to keep track of what he is looking for elsewhere on the map. Because we do know that he loves to roam. We do know that he loves to try and make plays pretty much everywhere that he can on the map. Uh, and you only have to look at some of the stats to identify some of those early game plays. Yeah, I love it. And you can see here displayed in the graphic how high of a dual proximity Mako has on the other side. Guess what? With Zillion, that's going to be remain very, very high, giving over experience there with the pa uh, passive. And Barrels is going to be extremely low. We expect an, a back first purchase of boots so that he can use that Predator go to go make that support jungle play early on. And I really love that Mako is just showing his versatility, right? He basically designed engaged support play <laughs> over in the LPL and has this world's demonstrated that he has a whole nother string to that bow, of course, and he's been just playing for so long. Yes. Really cool to see. So many enchanters. He fully embraced the Yumi meta. He, he certainly did. A <laughs> bu bunch of Yumi there as well, and it does go into this team being so constructed around Viper and Viper's success. Having a look at Flandre just shoving that wave in once again. Yasuo not exactly having the greatest of times in the early laning phase, but which Yasuo does, you know? The yeah. enemy team's Yasuo does. In, in the early stages, <laughs> uh, especially up on top side, is just looking to use the wind wall to avoid damage while still picking up CS. And then you can get some kill threats since you have a Zin Zhao. Uh, once you get post level six, you've got knockups from Barrel, you've got knockups from Zin. Even later, Ziggs can throw satchel charges and set you up. So they've, they've shown here. Uh, that they can definitely coordinate towards the later stages. And there's Barrel's first roam. He has his Predator boots, and he just comes over to support Showmaker as Scout uh, and Mako already showing here and shoving the wave in to get first move. Yeah, it feels like a bit of a chess match at the moment. Moving the pieces around, but not actually going for any takes. I mean, I always love it. The first game of a best of five, especially finals. There's just so much pressure mounting. Even as we have calm trades of CS and uh, and the draft kind of plays out as expected. But really for all of these players, as we see Barrel slowly returning to the bottom side, their entire year's worth of work, all of those scrims, all of those solo queue games, all of that practice, all of those reviews are distilled down to this one series and everything rides on this. So just a little bit of pressure. Yeah, you know. Little little bit. Bit. <laughs> <laughs> but you're quite right. And you know that in that first game, the person that makes the first play often is not always the one that's best set up for success. So it's about who will strike first, who will be the first to try and mount that lead. Because right now the gold is dead even. It has just been a large part of trading. The CS is even across the board. No early drakes have been prioritized, but it is this Herald that we have seen be a big part of the first contention as we are getting closer to that point. We're going to keep track of who looks to move first and these crucial item spikes. Yep, JJ on the bottom side of the map at the moment, but as is Canyon, we're one minute away from that Herald spawn, like you were talking about, and it's very dark in the bottom side river for Darmwon Kia. Ooh, so they weren't seen walking in, but the moment that control war drops, Darwin gets information as to where EDG is. Now they're looking to contest this red buff, and because Scout has the push in the mid lane, he will be able to assist. So EDG should be able to secure themselves the first enemy red. And this is very basic timer Ooh. control. Here's a realm warp, though. Yeah, let's see whether Ghost can survive this one. He might be able to, as Beryl's also battling, dancing his way out, but it doesn't work. First blood goes to Scout and EDG. So well executed by EDG, and it was about to go over the timings that are expected. When you know, because you put the ward as EDG up onto the blue buff, so there is a guaranteed red buff start for Damwon, you know that around 650, 645, second buff spawn comes up from the one that they started on. And so they go for the invade on that second round. But what they weren't really accounting for was the realm warp in the bottom lane. Vedius gets a little bit 
lackadaisical. They do not respect the all-in potential of EDG. And the LPL first on the board. But look at the answer here from Dom One because Showmaker TPs back into mid to guarantee that he can get the push. Beryl, after his death, immediately roamed mid, and he gets level six, as highlighted by Kadrill earlier. Utilizing that mid wave, being able to get that extra bit of experience, he's going to have that level up. And EDG, I think they're going to want to contest. Yep, Next teleport. Already getting into the pit here. The teleport does come out. Grand entrance onto the job, and they hold him up. The ulti's too good from Khan. Great stun comes through, but it's too late for Mako. And now Dom. Dom Kia moved back to the Herald. Ghost now getting them out of there, and the Hextech minefield is just too strong, and that is a comfortable take for Dom One Kia plus a kill. Dom One were first on position, and they punish JJ perfectly with the numbers advantage. Dom One can easily secure the objective, and just like that, we're back to one to one on the kill board. Yeah, you could say that again. The coordination from EDG is not there on the top side play, trying to come punish the, the early start on Rift Herald, but they're so desynced. But it's, you know, going right over the back of the wall, they're good focus fire from DK to punish. Uh, that is, that is given one back, you know, uses the Blast Cone, then you see Barrel immediately move in to try and push him out. Once he lands that knockup, as we talked about, there's so many setups for this Yasuo, and this is where you get the combination. You get hit with one knockup, instantly dead, full combo from Damwon, well played by them to punish. And this was something that we see from EDG during their semifinals as well, where a lot of their engage comes off the back of JJ. So if he's gone, there is no more follow-up. You are very reliant on him to start the fights for you and to be able to close the gap against this Damwon composition. So really good target focus there from Damwon, uh, but the gold is still in the favor for now, for e in favor of EDG. Yeah, EDG simply have to be much more precise with their timings here. You can't, can't leave anyone out to straggle there. And if you do, you have to respect the all-in. Uh, you know, no flash blown or anything like that. We're in the world, though, now, uh, living with this Rift Herald in the hands of Canyon. And when you have Ziggs on your team, it also has that extra level of threat that you can move uh, the Ziggs around to the same lane. And oftentimes, especially if you've done some early work on that tower, you can just Rift Herald into Satchel Charge and blow up a first objective. So That's this predator. game yeah. could be very explosive. Yeah, Viper able to sidestep the grand entrance, so not quite able to predator his way forward enough there with Beryl, but still gets Viper out of the way. Not able to get any summon spells just yet, though, as in goes Showmaker. As I say that, SVG Parabellum says, oh my god, Khan is going out with a statement. Damwon Kia for the win, let's go, boys. <laughs> well, yeah, followed up on the Rakan knockup right well with the yep, Yasuo ultimate did. there. That R button yeah. is working. I'd like to just like raise a point that you brought up though. The level six that was gained by Beryl and not Mako was so important there. If Mako has the ultimate, all of that chain CC and that lockdown on a single yeah. target isn't quite as powerful because the Jarvan just hops back up again. So this could be very important moving further forward in the game. It certainly could be. And I think that right now, the only reason why EDG have that gold lead is because they're able to secure a play in mid, they secured a play in bot, but Dom1 have this Herald in their back pocket. The question is where they want to invest it. You could go to the Ziggs lane in theory, because of course you do have the Satchel Charge to be able to secure towers early, but it depends on where you want to invest your money. Perhaps it makes more sense to try and funnel more gold into Khan when you know he's going to be one of your big late game threats in a side lane and in team fights as well. Or perhaps you just want to break that mid tower because you know CJ against Scout with his wave clear could be difficult with this composition from Dom One in the early game at least. Close, but not quite a cigar there. <laughs> yeah, mid lane tower would definitely be the ideal situation to get down early. It's just such a big objective when you do have the setup here that Dom One do with possibilities of Showmaker's LeBlanc, one of the most feared combinations that we have in the tournament getting fed early with the early kill actually going to him. He's the one to get the last hit onto JJ, which is very important for them. But if you then take the mid tower and let him roam around with this assassin pick, you lose control of your brush and that makes your rotations between objectives so much longer because you have to respect all this extra positioning and your lack of vision. And I've had a few requests, gentlemen, um, since we announced that we were going to be doing the final. A lot of requests for no Cloud Souls. And thankfully, our first Drake is, in fact, a Cloud Drake, so no Cloud Souls for game number one. I'm sad, but uh, most of you guys at home are probably going to be a bit happy. I mean, that. I think also this is one of those games when you have Jin plus Zillion. The Cloud Soul would have been great. Yeah, yeah right. right. <laughs> but we can see that that Herald is I was ready is to good. talk about it, but then I saw that <laughs> it came up too early. I was very upset. As Herald is going to charge into the mid lane, grab some plates here as Barrel. Sidesteps the stun from Viper, and EDG have to just lose a few plates, but otherwise not too much more. From EDG's perspective, this is really best case scenario for them. Yeah, you right. know, it's dropped, it's not really used optimally. You only get a couple plates, and 
Dom one realized that there's not that much time left for us to get that much gold, but that mid lane tower still stays healthy. So with EDG holding this small gold lead, I think that they're still feeling pretty comfortable for the time being. They also threatened moving Ziggs towards mid though. So here we go. There's the Predator again. Quickness tied in with it as well, and Scout has nowhere to go. Beryl tanks up the turret for a long time, but he can. They're going to be fine, and that's just the pick from the 2v2 in the mid lane. And we talked about this one. coming out of the draft. Would Dan one look to attack mid lane? And this is the first successful gank that we were able to see from Beryl. Chains he's seeing up Scout perfectly. He doesn't have the cleanse to get away from the charm. Ends up falling to the setup from the LeBlanc as well. And now Dan one for the first time in the game, hold themselves with the gold lead. And you need to look back at how they set that up. In the Rift Herald play, rotating the entire bottom lane over with Ziggs coming through, they clear out this vision, if you see in the in the top side river there, and then Barrel coming back for the repeat on that Rakan, making good on his catch here onto Scout. Again, this is another pick by the Rakan. No flash blown by the target, and kill successful. Is given over as far as the Dragon, though. First one picked up for EDG, and let's remember that they do have some good scaling options on their side, namely with that Zillion to counter some of the burst damage options as well as some side lane opportunities for Ryze later. I wanted to talk a little bit about this, because oftentimes we talk about scaling when it comes to uh, comps like this, but let's have a look at this replay first. Yeah, great, great thing about this, good vision toggle by the Observers. That Fog of War you just saw was previously cleared out by them, so Barrel lies in wait. They get the full lockup onto Scout, and by the time he's done with the charm, with the CC, he knows he's dead. Uh, so well executed here by Dom Juan. Kind of surgical in, a, in some of these early moves. It was just the one mistake not respecting the early Realm Warp on bottom side that led to that first blood going to EDG. Yeah, it's been a pretty interesting back and forth in this early game, but really it's the mid game where I think we get to see some of the best League of Legends from both of these teams. EDG typically, yeah, they'll throw a couple ganks out in the early game, but it is that transition from the early to mid where they leverage their early gold lead to strong team fighting. And it's the same for Dom Juan where this is where you start to unlock them on the map. This is where they'll really start to look for those picks and start to unlock with their composition. Well, they're looking for a bit of a pick here as Mako's burning down for now. In goes JJ though into the back side. It's flash out immediately from Ghost as the Jarvan out of position, but still able to grab the kill. And look at all of that healing as well. He's going to get resurrected from the Chrono Shift. And now it's Darmon Kia that are on the run. Canyon is not rooted just yet, but Khan is just dead. Down goes Canyon as well. And there is the Rift Herald. And they get it with the Viper shot here. Rift Herald plus. The extra kills, the Zillion effect is already online, boys. Mako's there to save his life. Revival, they get the extra kills, and they're going to take retake control of this game. Now with second Herald, yes, you don't get turret plate money, but you get a lot of control of choosing which side lane you want to push in first. And breaking down turrets is so important as well as we check this one out one more time. Mako goes down low, but crucially doesn't die. Exactly. Some of the big threats to Zillion are burst damage trying to bait out the ultimate, but Mako stays strong. He keeps it up here. JJ even buys time by smiting the Rift Tail, gaining health to walk back over to the safety of Mako's waiting arms. And in the early game especially, those revives give you so much more time. Uh, and it's hard to to work through some extra cooldowns. There. There's no more DPS left for Dom Juan, so well done by EDG to actually fend them off, plus securing the objective. I think what we saw there as well was why I think a lot of future teamfights are going to look like and why Ghost in particular is super important, because there's a lot of single target damage that comes out from this Dom Juan squad, and Zillion loves that, because you throw all your burst onto a single target, he then revives them, and it's only Ziggs that can do a lot of AoE as EDG now looking to attack Khan. Yeah, Khan doesn't have a lot of options right now as he's trying to dash his way around, and it looks like EDG might have been thwarted for the moment. They will put down the Rift Herald, though. And so Khan will still need to vacate the area, but he does so with his life. Exactly. EDG choose the bottom side for the Rift Herald. Bottom side down immediately. First turret bonus, actually, 17 minutes into the game for them. So they get paid extremely well for this. And remember, they're focusing pretty heavily on these team fights, displaying why they keep picking JJ Jarvan over and over and over. This is his seventh Jarvan game in a row. They simply walk over to second Rift Hail, start the fight out with the Cataclysm, force it down, knowing that they have the Zillion to come back them up. 
Uh, and now pushing their winnings ahead on these objectives. And gentlemen, coming into this series, we knew that early game would be important. And I just want to highlight some of these early game stats that we see from EDG because in their wins, and this is at 15, they have a huge early game gold yeah. advantage. It was 15-30 where they got this gold advantage, but EDG looks best Wait, when they're able to... Wait, at 15 minutes, were they ahead? It was 15-30. Well, that they got ahead, yes. All right, so they weren't ahead at 15 minutes. They were not, is. actually. It's a Ooh, contentious one for sure. very dangerous. But the, the point is that you can see that when they get ahead, usually they're actually very good at closing things out. Their average game time is very short in both wins and losses. This team does not like to waste time. So let's see if EDG can translate this into a big win against Darmon in the final. Yeah, will be absolutely huge. Scout, clearing out some waves on the top side of the map as Darmon Kiel looking to try and get some vision parity around this mid lane. Viper dashing on forward. And of course, that extra movement speed that you get from the Zillion is so important for a champion like Jin that can run so damn fast. Yeah, it's very good at short trades. Whenever you, you know, have limited uh, uh, attack speed here from the from the four bullet setup from Jin, you want as short trades as possible. So the extra speed is really well paired with him. We also need to look at just the overall objectives of these two teams and how they are different with the teleport coming in from Scout. EDG want to focus on that team fight, grouping up with the Zillion. Meanwhile, DK need to get a surgical pick here and make use of their surprise burst damage as well as locking someone up with that CC. Or else the Zillion is just going to take over. Yeah, full information for both teams right now. Eyes on this Infernal Drake. The Scout getting poked, but EDG's health bar is still pretty high. Well in control of the river for the moment. Darmon have a lot of options for getting over this wall if they want to. The Blast Cone also there. If they want to contest for this Drake, but the positioning still better for EDG as Showmaker dives into the pit, distorts his way out, and that is just a pick off. And EDG burst down the Drake, and now there's nothing to fight for for Darmon Kiel. And look, EDG also have control over the mid wave, so they should be able to push this one out as Darmon is looking for picks. The root comes down. Yeah, Scout goes down relatively low, but it's the burst damage onto Showmaker. He has to get out. He's got a bomb, but it doesn't do very much damage. As now Canyon with the ulti will keep himself alive. Scout burning down, but he's going to survive for the moment. We don't have an ulti out of the Zig, so Scout is going to be okay. Mako has ice in his veins. He is not wasting this cooldown. He's like, Scout, walk it off, okay? <laughs> You're going to be fine. I'm not using my ultimate. And saving that in these critical moments really does mean the difference between life and death. It does mean the difference between Damwon still pushing down an objective afterwards. The huge chunk in health is enough to still earn them that objective. Wow, but very tense moment there because you could see that EDG was making it very difficult for Darmon to get a pick. They they were positioning themselves in a very traditional front-to-back manner where the Jarvan was constantly on the front line, forcing Darmon to come into him and saying, if you're going to engage, I'm the target that you're going to force. Meanwhile, Scout was hovering just behind him, waiting for those potential pick opportunities, and Darmon really struggled to gain access into the river. That means that they couldn't really contest a Drake, and it wasn't until after when EDG spread out a little bit more that then they could look for that pick. Unfortunately for Darmon, they couldn't really convert it into a kill, but as you rightly said, Kobe, they do get themselves a town. Exactly, though. I love the, the positioning because it's so important for EDG, and it's, it's going to be a lot on watching the support because for Mako, he has to remain close enough to Viper to be able to uh, obviously give him the speed boost and be around for the ultimate for whoever's getting focused, but also separate himself so that you don't get caught in the Rakan combo. You know, Barrel with the Predator is constantly looking for pockets of Fog of War to find those engages, and if you can lock up both targets, that's where you get your win. I very much agree with you, Kobe, because I think that Beryl finding a flank is going to be the most important thing for Darmon, because the combination with Yasuo immediately gives you access onto the backline, and the moment that that chaos begins, that is where Darmon's better set up for success with their highly mobile composition. Yeah, that's why in the mid game, we're going to be hyper-focused on this vision game. Uh, vision is definitely not one of the easiest metrics for people to track uh, for team successes because it's not on scoreboard. You know, like the gold uh, in Briggs Lights. <laughs> yeah. Very easy for you, but it is critical to the success of their operations here. And let's see, Showmaker is LeBlanc, plus he has Flash, so a lot of tools to try and get away from this one. Jarvan is not the best at setting up any sort of ganks onto LeBlanc. Yeah, you should be all right. Rise is yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I'm going to move on in. Let's see whether the Rune Prison comes out, and the answer is no, as we have a uh, Distortion available. Of course, the Mimic also having to be used, but it's on basically no cooldown, so never mind that one. Baron has spawned a couple of minutes ago. Could be something potentially worth fighting over, but I love that you bring up Vision. I wanted to talk about this, because both of these teams want to do different things. EDG, 
phenomenal 5v5 style of composition, but Damwon, they want to split you up around the map. They want to play those shadow games. And like you were talking about, you need vision control if you're going to do that. You certainly do. And I think that right now, when we kind of have a quick look at the map, you can see that there's a lot of control in favor of Damwon when it comes to the river. They have good access into the top side. They have a couple wards littered around the bot side as well. And ultimately, Damwon's investment is they're using mid very well. When we talk about that mid tower going down, initially it doesn't look like that much of an advantage, but you can see how Damwon converted into a lot of vision control. And the moment that you control the river, it means that you have access to move towards these side lanes, and they just use that to be able to protect their top lane tier one. Another tactic Damwon can utilize because they are, they are enabled by the Ziggs plus two possible split pushers here with high amounts of burst damage is if you just put Ghost and Barrel mid lane as we see the chase through the river. Yeah. You keep them mid lane, they have insane wave clear, and they're extremely safe, and you try and force the Zillion to show mid. Then you can force a play out of Fog of War on, one, on either the Yasuo or the LeBlanc's lane and have Ghost just travel halfway and throw the ultimate. That amount of extra damage and, and the burst damage can come through to get you that actual kill for your split pusher while still knowing that the Zillion is kind of forced mid to keep the Jin safe. And you, you try and utilize your extra couple steps there in the long range to get those surprise kills. So that kind of builds off your spreading the map point. Showmaker diving forward, looking for JJ, but he's so fast. Mako is really enabling this jungler right now. As Canyon becomes lightning, but unable to find a target quite yet. As Flandre trying to rotate up, JJ down quite low. The chains will connect, but not able to follow up. Just 50% of the health bar of the Jarvan as the reward here. Still 2,000 gold the lead for EDG, and they're controlling this river. 15 seconds on the Drake, which is what they had their eyes on. That's going to be sole point for EDG if they can lock it down. As JJ, once again, actually copping a bit of damage here from Showmaker. It is going to be fine. They get vision of the Jarvan, and that's who they want to take down. Damwon, they have to remember, they're going to have to do it twice if they want it to stick. Damwon just leveraging that poke right now. A lot of damage. Here we go. Yeah, Scout now going to take a lot of damage. There is the Chrono Shift. And EDG not able to follow up too much. The Curtain Call comes out, but not able to do relevant damage. Ghost getting taken down so low with that last bullet. And Damwon now going to be backing away. EDG still lying in wait with control of that brush. Scout is getting out of range so he can revive back or heal back up at the tower and then teleport out. It's going to get dangerous for Damwon. Showmaker flirting with a flank around the outside. There's the teleport and Scout has returned. Yeah, Showmaker gonna dive into the pit, tries to take the Drake, but he's not gonna be able to get there. And that is going to be sole point for EDG, a big advantage now in map control for the Chinese squad. And we're seeing once again how valuable the Zillion pick is because the obnoxious thing about Darmont's comp is they start off the Baron. I'll have to hold off my point because they are forcing EDG to come and answer. And answer they shall. Teleport used from Graves. They're going into the river. Headstrong, Atlas, can they stop them? It looks like they're gonna make them second guess it. I think we've got some technical problems over there. Are you good? Yeah, yep, I'm absolutely fine. We've sorted it out. Nice. We're looking for a Baron here, and Damwon Kia taking it down to about 4K. Flandre looking for the backside. Damwon Kia have been split, and the three in the pit are gonna have to get out of there. Great satchel charge, try and divide them. And now JJ, maybe they're the ones getting routed. The pincer maneuver here from Damwon Kia. The Realm Warp gets Scout in there, but he's got the Chrono Shift. He's gonna be absolutely fine. It's a one for one for the moment as they get rid of the Zillion, but Six is also dead. Some low health bars, but so far, EDG in a good position. There it is as it is evened out by Damwon Kia. Down goes Viper, and now EDG looking to try and get out. Three versus three for now, but it's Damwon Kia with control of the river. And with the scattered fight, they actually chase them down. Barrow's ultimate coming back up, and they just make the all-in convert onto Viper, regaining control around that Baron. That was a close one, Betty. Well, it certainly was. The fact that Damwon immediately went to the Baron after the Dragon suggested that, as you rightly identified, Kobe, they were trying to force that TP out from Flandre, but also the positioning from Showmaker and Barrel on the flank set themselves up perfectly to create this collapse. The EDG attack one of the weak sides, but Damwon do a great job of just stalling buying time, using their mobility. And then the moment EDG commit, this is when Damwon get to leverage their mobility. A huge ultimate from Ghost does so much damage to allow Showmaker to pick up a couple of back picks, but EDG no slouches either, getting kills it overall, resulting in a two for two. Yeah, one of the biggest things to track to in the next iteration of this team fight is how Damwon are using these immunity spells. The Zin ultimate, of course, to create space and give you a pseudo frontline, but also the wind wall from Khan is a pretty big window, whereas EDG, they're looking for that all in, and you see it with JJ forcing on Jarvan and then being followed up by the realm warps here coming from Scout. 
uh, and long range from Viper trying to hit those W snares to force them into these fights. Whereas Don Juan are remaining very slippery. Uh, and again, spreading out the map, committing this Yasuo to the bottom side. Khan continues to scale up and still has his teleport available if there's a hard push on the other side. Yeah, I was going to talk about the teleport advantage, EDG, not with too many options on that front. Realm Warp is available for Scout, though, so he can do a bit of sidelining. You can see he's catching that bottom wave right now. It's going to be double TPs for Don Juan Kia, though, giving them a lot of flexibility in order to get around and get things done. And already, you can see Canyon clearing out vision in this Baron pit. Baron definitely on the minds of Don Juan Kia. And I feel like this whole game, it's been a 2,000 gold lead <laughs> from the minute one. Yeah. It is. It has been very close. There was a brief window where Don were able to get slightly ahead, but immediately taken back by ADG. And I'm just so happy that we're getting to see two teams deliver when it comes to the team fighting. Because coming into this tournament, expectations were that EDG was one of the favorites to the tournament. And while there has been some skepticism around their performance at this World Championship, the reality is that they have always been known as an excellent team fighting team. And right now, they're going toe to toe with Don. And their focus on committing to this style. When, when they walked up to Rift Hail number two and forced it through and had the confidence playing off, the, off of that revive and forcing it through, that's where they really retook control of this game because, yeah, Rift Hail number one uh, was terrible for them and Dom Juan had, had a very good early start trying to open up the map. And yet, EDG remained true to themselves. A lot of people, most people, uh, giving overwhelming support to Dom Juan as far as this series goes. So it's very heartening to see the LPL represented with all of the hopes of the entire region on their shoulders. Well, yeah, that's dangerous. the turnaround. Flandre dived on in, thought that it was going to be for him as, oh, can he get out of the way? Yes, he definitely can. And so the lockdown, not quite enough there from Khan's ultimate. The Graves is going to survive. That was crazy from Flandre. Yeah, he just goes in one versus two and is able to get away with his life as well. Wow, didn't have to burn the flash because he didn't have it. Does get the Ignite out from Beryl. Can go back to base. TP comes through from Khan. TP Uz is up from Flandre. Not going to use it yet. Yeah, there's another knock up under JJ, but he's going to be absolutely fine. Gets over that wall. No magic mantle helping him out just there. And notice, Damon are just trying to poke around here while they have Yasuo push on top side. That huge minion wave crashes into the low health turret, and then they force on Baron. Yep, let's see JJ. Going to be on Vision as soon as he comes out of that brush, but EDG, they can go for an answer here. Control Ward in the pit, they know exactly the health bar, and Damwon Kia, are they looking for a turn? Do they actually have the coordinated damage to lock anyone down before Mako can bring them back to life? In goes JJ, they just explode Showmaker! He is so important for their team fight, and he goes golden as well. He's got the Sterics, he's got the Chrono Shift, it's an immortal job in trying to win the team fight. And EDG have lost no one. In goes Barrel once again, but it's going to be a sacrifice. And Don Juan Kia are left with corpses on the rift. And EDG have done it, Atlas! Brute force right into the face of Don Juan. They are squished like bugs on the windshield. That is a clean ace. That is a Baron. Fedius, this game is wide open. EDG have just smashed it. EDG are delivering in the fights and they execute it perfectly. It was Viper that sunk his teeth into the heart of Don Juan. He found Showmaker, the pick that was needed to tear apart Dom One. It tore the fight wide open. EDG get themselves an ace, they get the Baron, they get the Soul, and they are looking to get game one in this best of five. This is so big for JJ too. You know, the, all the focus on Jarvan, him being the front line. Look at this here. Viper, beautiful hit into the root, immediate follow up from JJ to set up for the fight. Exactly, you'll have to see, no hesitation there. Complete trust in their teammates. Viper lands the snare, this, this Jin seal away followed up so well by the team and they get every last one. So not only is it a clean ace, it's just huge map control since they're the ones with the extra effort towards their team fight. They're the ones with the zillion scaling so well here towards the later stages. You just get to destroy the entire map with this Baron as well. Look at this Baron power play start to explode. Two minutes left on it and they're already at 2.7k. And they had the, the Dragon Soul waiting for them as well. So Ocean Soul now encircling EDG at the same time. Another five minutes, and it's going to be that Elder Drake time, but the Rebel Baron power play is only getting larger. This series is EDG's chance to shock the world. Dom One, the defending world champions, already going so heavily down in game number one here. It's just such a huge step by EDG. Let's see if they can finish it. 
The attempts at split push here from Domwon are going to get outpaced very quickly by a full Baron Dub team. Yes, this is a lot of minions and a lot of champions here. Showmaker looking for a bit of a flank, but there is no real option. Khan's going to be backing, look to try and get back and assist the rest of his team, but his house has been blown up, gentlemen. <laughs> It's not a great time, and Showmaker able to get himself out of the Cataclysm, but EDG, they can do this all day. Forced to flash, and oh look, the Realm Warp is coming through immediately. They're gonna rotate yep. up to top. They've circumvented the wave that they don't have by leveraging the Realm Warp, and they're now looking to break onto the final inhibitor. Not that many minions, so Damwon should be able to hold. And look at this, Maker also clearing out the flank for any potential TP wars that could come in from behind. They recognize that they've taken everything that they should right now. They're going to disengage, they're going to back off, but the base of Darmwon is in tatters. Yeah, EDG with just methodical movement, making sure there was absolutely no way any flank was going to happen. They had vision exactly where they needed it to be, and now 8,000 gold is their lead. Two inhibitors are down. This is poised to be EDG taking game one. This is just so big for them, Atlas. The the poise that they have had on stage, the composure here, uh, und unperturbed by a lot of this pick potential from Damwon. And for them to execute here in finals after just this year, finally breaking their quarterfinal curse, yeah. is so big for them, so big for the region. They've been to Worlds five times previously and never gotten past quarterfinals. And now already getting a leg up in the finals. Remnants of this Baron power play will time out, but 4.1k is it definitely going to be something you take to the bank. It definitely is not bad, as EDG is a bit of a demonstration of their domestic prowess. I think a lot of people might remember some worlds where things didn't go quite so well for EDG. I know <laughs> Just I, a few. I know I certainly <laughs> three do. Of, three of those times, by the way, of their five worlds appearances, they were the number one seed yeah. of LPL and highly disappointed the region by not getting past quarterfinals. But this is why it's such a big triumph for them to be here and to get the lead. Well, let's see whether they can close it out. That lady certainly started warming up her voice box, but she hasn't quite <laughs> You can hear her in the yet. distance, Alice. Yeah, yeah, there's some yodeling happening. I can hear uh. it in the far reaches, but it hasn't started just yet for real. Damwon Kia looking to try to defend their last bastions of hope. Three turrets remain. But EDG are just so strong. The real struggle right now for EDG is just this Ziggs wave clear that is kind of holding the line against EDG Siege. But look, they're going to commit again. The wave clear continues to come through, but perhaps it will not be enough. The five man of EDG looking it well, to go in. Flash Cataclysm comes forward, and JJ just trying to put them in position, but it's Canyon. He's got the ultimate, and now the dive forward from Beryl. It does not work out. The grand entrance only hits one, and then he just pops like a balloon. The wind wall looks comically ineffective as now the Nexus turrets are falling. And for a series that so many predicted was a 3-0. Yes, it might be, but it's not going to be for oh. Darmwon Kia. Edward Gaming absolutely wiping the floor with our former world champions. They make sure they finish the job before they finish off the Nexus. EDG with a very strong performance in game one, and they stuck to their style. They got exactly what they wanted. They got Flandre on a comfort pick with his Graves, his most played champion at Worlds, and he was extremely reliable as a carry on the top side of the map. They didn't really invest a huge amount into Scout, but where they could, they got leads in their bot lane, and they just out Team Fort Darmwan at every opportunity. In the opening of the day, we were looking at, wow, this team is so easy to predict. All these Graves <laughs> yeah. picks, all these Jarvan <laughs> picks, all these Rise picks. Yes, exactly. They stick with those Vedias, and yet they also take one page out of the T1 book, the zillion that they showed, to further complement what was already a strength of the team. And that's what I love, when you can take pieces and you can, you can add on, you can augment what is already your strength. Yeah, exactly right. And it's just another string to add to their bow that, that Darmon has to think about in the nef next draft. But remember to check out Darmon Kia's song that represents their playstyle. Go or Stop by Sunmi, along with the songs for the rest of the teams participating at Worlds 2021 on the official LoL playlist on Spotify. In the meantime, we're taking a short break, but we'll be right back for another look at Game 1 of the Worlds Final. The magical power of the realm is a mystery. Like a guardian, it is with you always. Defending you, charging you, watching over you like... 
Actually, it's not magic. It's this Cisco network. The power behind every gank, every combo, every mind-blowing moment at League of Legends World Championships.
Welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk, where EDG take game one in incredible fashion over the defending world champions. Uh, Kajol, we're going to dive straight into it because we only got so much time before those teams head back onto stage to do battle yet again. But it starts in the draft, where EDG... Pulling out that zillion yeah. in response to Kanz Yasuo as uh -huh. well. So a couple interesting things, but uh, doing a, doing our best carrier impression over there for Mako, huh? So many cool things in this draft. Remnants from the T1 versus Damon series where you've got Yasuo into Graves in the top lane, like almost like a counter matchup, pairing it with Rakan Ziggs, right? Very clear combo, Rakan goes in, Yasuo ult onto a Ziggs ult. The problem is this last pick zillion saved the draft. So that three-man combo that full, full commits onto one target is negated completely from the start of the game. And then the second setup you have, the, the I think that Damwon found success with in two of their wins against T1. They played three games of LeBlanc. One of them they had Draven, they lost. The other two they had Jin. The reason was LeBlanc dashes forwards, throws out a Q, Jin W, that's a pick. This has no follow-up. LeBlanc can dash forwards and do as much burst as she wants. You can't make a pick off of it. You can't really burst anyone either. So it felt like the only worry I had for EDG's comp is you're playing Rise into LeBlanc's Zinza, which is, you know, Damwon's bread and butter against T1, where they just keep ganking mid. Scout was able to negate a lot of that. Not much came through mid, only one kill when Barrel went there. Mm -hmm. And then from team fights onwards, it was just EDG favorite from the beginning. From also the get important to note, no Lee Sin available for Canyon. But as you talk about team fighting and the, and the success, rather, that EDG found with it, I think it's important for us to dive into how exactly it's happened. We've seen some great team fighting from the LPL champions. And Azale's over here to break it down for us in Neighborhood Tactics, presented by State Farm. Thank you very much. I just wanted to talk about one of my favorite things about EDG. It is their team fight positioning. It is incredible. After you watch this, I'll break down what they do, and you'll be able to watch them do it over and over again. Now, how they start out these fights is what I will lovingly refer to as the line. Almost always, you will see them in this type of a positioning. They don't like to play their team fight split. They don't like to fight, you know, on two on one side, three on another, or one four with someone flanking. They like to be in this long spread line. Now, this makes it very difficult for their opponents to actually find engages on multiple members. And what it also does is it allows the sides to actually collapse. You know, if FPX moves forward towards Scout, the other sides are actually going to be able to come in and collapse and all be in range and kind of have this firing line on the core squad here of FPX. Now, this is actually from the finals, and we can see it in action. As FPX is moving forward, you can see them maintaining this line, trying to stay in this type of positioning as much as is possible. FPX is actually very bottled up here. So as they move forward, they actually face check Scout, and you'll see the sides are collapsing in. They're able to actually move forward. Everyone is hitting here from EDG, where you look at the carries here from FPX, they're in the back. They're not able to do anything. This positioning is allowing EDG to have more surface area to actually attack. And it's something that is incredibly effective that they use almost every single time you will see them fight. They do it all throughout Worlds, all throughout LPL. And we can see another example of it actually in the game that we just watched. Now, they won't start in this positioning, and I'm not gonna say that it's a perfect line every single time, but you'll see them move into this because this is really their bread and butter. As they move over towards the Herald fight, they know that they're gonna have to face check in towards Damwon. So again, they're trying to set up this kind of spread out line here along the top. And even as the fight breaks out, you'll again see, yes, JJ is going to be moving forward, but as they start to actually kite back as the fight extends, they'll again try to move back into this kind of like neutral setup that they really do enjoy. Here once more, the line makes its appearance. And this is just something that they use really, really consistently. And the fact that they're able to set it up in basically every single team fight really does speak to their coordination, to their communication, and to how aware they are of their positioning and how they want to play out every single team fight. Uh, thank you so much for that breakdown, Azale. Again, it was the team fighting that came up huge for EDG in this victory here in game one of the best of five. And uh, we're going to watch a few more of those team fights, I'm sure. But we're also going to do it with the context of our OPPO player of the game. It's JJ because we talked about how Canyon, possibly the best player in the world right now, possibly the best jungler the game has ever seen, especially if he takes this series. And so JJ was going to have his work cut out for him. But in game one, Cajal, he delivered. Oh, yeah, he definitely did. Some of these engagements. 
engages are so clean. This one right here, knowing Beryl doesn't have E because he used it a couple seconds ago, EQing and making sure the engage happens and having a zillion right behind him so he has absolutely no fear. Target selection from EDG was fantastic from start to finish. Uh, and J JJ, I mean, he's played seven games of Jarvan in a row and he's played nine games of the World Championship. It is their highest prio. And this fight right here, I think he played it phenomenally. Knowing he has a zillion behind him, flash ulting, EQing, making sure to get multiple knockups, stop watching after getting a four-man gore drinker and then having a zillion right behind him. I mean, the root as well from Viper to actually set that up, you know, they don't have the best consistent CC to actually lock down a LeBlanc. That's a Jin root to actually set that up. Then zero hesitation. Again, JJ knowing exactly his role in these team fights. EDG communicates and executes incredibly well, and that is why they are such a terrifying 5v5 team. Now, so I'll be honest, uh, much like the two of you, expected Dom Juan to come out with the victory here today in the series, and honestly never expected to say the words I'm about to say, which is that they are behind. They are on the back foot in this series, now down 1-0. to zero. They're going back to blue side, Kadrill. What do you want to see? I think change it up a little bit, maybe prioritize the Jarvan yourself more and take that away from JJ, seven games in a row. I think a stronger jungle matchup would be good. I think the last time that um, Damon played up against Jarvan, against T1, I believe Canyon was playing things like Kiana, where he can have some, some kind of self-independence to play the game based on picks. And I think they need to make sure they don't drop Jin priority, maybe banning out Jin or first picking it, or banning out Jarvan or first picking it. Well, the LPL squad is out to an early lead. Today's World Finals, though, marks the end of an amazing year for League of Legends, and we want to take a moment to celebrate the fans cheering from across the globe. Thank you for for a great year, and we look forward to seeing you again in 2022. We miss you. Hello, SK fans. Hello, World fans. Hello, World fans. This mundial has been incredible. And you've been rooting on our pros. No matter where you are in the world, the voices of our hearts will be heard. At the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you. Muito obrigado. Mas a ação ainda não acabou. Então curte as finais aí. Obrigado. Obrigado.